So I'm gonna tell this story. It's a really important story to ground what it means to have employees who are responsible and who do what's called task ownership. And this is actually a real story. It was a story that came out of a school. There's only one classroom in this entire school that was using our responsibility-based culture model. And this teacher knew that the priority that she had in bringing in this model was to learn how to transfer responsibility to her students, to own the tasks that were theirs to own in order to be personally responsible and uh, fully engaged. So some of those tasks are things like managing their own relationships, managing their own productivity, engagement, plan for progress, their own skills, mastery, those kinds of things. Uh, just like you have cross-functional meetings in, in companies, they had classroom meetings to problem solve and to list you know, areas of concern and so on. And so in this classroom, the teacher had invited me to come and help her, to model to her, how does she do this transfer of responsibility? And it just so happens that the day that I attended this classroom meeting, that one of the eighth grade boys came in and said, I want to put something on the agenda that just happened this morning. And what had happened was that the school had adopted what's called a peace pledge. It's kind of like a pledge of allegiance. Only in this instance, they had to put their hands on their heart and say, I promise I pledge to use my words and actions for peace. And he said, I don't have a problem with the pledge. I have a problem with the fact that the homeroom teacher you know, was harsh and pointed to us and said, if any of you don't do this pledge, you're going to get a detention, which is kind of ironic, right? And so his agenda item was, I don't want to be bullied by teachers in this school. And so he put that on his, uh, you know, to talk about during the meeting. So when it came up, the teacher looked at me and said, would you show me how you would do task ownership and, you know, transfer of responsibility on this? And I said, okay. So I asked him, I said, first of all, what do you want regarding this agenda item? Do you, and what do you want regarding peace? Do you want peace in the school? And he said, well, yeah, I do. And I said, good. I said, do you want peace with that teacher that's bullying you? And he said, I do. And I said, good. And I said, then are you willing to look at where you're doing war? And he said, me, how am I doing war? I'm not, the, I'm the one being bullied. And I said, that is true. And are you willing to look in case you find some places you're doing war? And he said, okay. And I said, do you ever say bad things about this teacher behind her back? And he said, well, yeah, I hate her. And I said, huh, anything war-like about hate and gossip? And he said, well, yeah, you know, and I said, okay, do you ever try to go to her and work out your problems with her? And he says, well, no, we're all afraid of her. And I said, do you know that fear of a person is being in attack mode? And he said, no, I don't know that. What do you mean? And I said, if a dog comes running at you and it's barking at you and it's ferocious with you, if you get more afraid, will that dog get more hostile or less hostile? And he said, that dog will get more hostile. And I said, you're absolutely right, why? He said, I don't know. I've never understood why that would happen, never thought about it. And I said, the reason the dog gets more hostile is because when you're afraid of the dog, the dog knows you have it in a monster box. The dog knows that you are hostile toward it because you see it as enemy. And they're gonna feel it as though you're an attack to them, so they're gonna up their own attack back at you. So you're actually, by being afraid of your homeroom teacher, you're actually in a war mode with her. And he said, wow, I never knew that. And I said, well, of course you didn't because nobody's taught you that. So now that you see the places you're doing war, what do you wanna do now? And he said, well, I wanna go to her and try to work it out, but I don't even know how to begin. I said, well, isn't it great that you guys have time and a group of 20 students and a teacher, and in this case, a consultant, all available to help you role play and brainstorm and come up with ways you're gonna to go to her with your intention for peace. And so what was really amazing, and this is gonna to happen to you in your workplace, when one person becomes responsible and that transfer occurs, other people automatically start becoming more responsible. So like other kids, started to say, I'll go with you because I've been doing war and I didn't know I was doing war with her. And the teacher even came to me afterwards and said, I know you're doing school reform. I wanna leave my role as a teacher at the end of this year and do school reform with you because I'm tired of looking at all these values plastered all over the walls of the school. They're about as crazy as saying reading is essential and math is crucial. 
and not having any reading or math classes. And if we don't know how to teach kids to have this responsibility and this ownership and this ability to manage these things like relationships, we're really doing them a huge disservice. So as that student's responsibility rose, so did everyone's. And what's also really important about this story, there's lots and lots of things you could take out of this story. Two other ones that I'll just say right now are when you're transferring responsibility to employees, you have to become more Socratic. What do you want? What do you want regarding peace? Do you, you know, do you want peace with that teacher? Now, what do you want to do? Did you know that this is this? It's all very much a questioning process more than an advising and counseling process. And also, it's such a great example of how you can take a really good tool, like a peace pledge or a communication tool, and you can plaster it on top of a faulty foundation that ruins that tool and its effectiveness. And I see that happening over and over again in businesses that are trying to change culture. They bring in all kinds of like, what almost feel like band-aids if you haven't corrected the underlying infection or problem that's going on. And you know, that's probably the, the main thing I want you to know by the end of this presentation is how important it is to get all the roots out of the problems underneath a lack of responsibility and task ownership. No, I'm good. Okay, so a responsibility-based culture is one where you have buy-in from everyone at every level. And I want you guys to think about that. Most organizations think about leadership development as if it's developing the people that have the leadership titles in the company. And that's not what we mean by leadership development. We mean leadership development in everyone, in every role, at every age, with every level of of, of experience. And that's why in that school, she knew that the responsibility-based culture required her to, to teach her children, her students, how to pick up responsibility for things. So everyone begins to work collaboratively. And that's because certain core needs are met within each person that we'll talk about in a little bit, but it allows people to embrace a common mission, a, a common purpose, to become inclusive, to become supportive rather than judgmental. So it doesn't mean that when you're taking away control, which I'm going to be talking about, it doesn't mean you come in with wishy-washy milk toast and a lack of firmness. You actually have to have higher expectations of people, but they feel that you want them to love their life. They feel your positive intention toward them. And so I just want you to know that a responsibility-based culture is a more demanding and more fulfilling kind of culture to build, but it's not for the faint of heart. So when you do it well, your organization will thrive and you'll see a lot of rewards from it. So what causes people to not be personally responsible? What causes them to shut down and disengage? What causes them to cause more problems than solutions? The main thing that, it, that causes it is something that Adler coined the phrase up for, which is inferiority complex. You listen to people that are speaking on this today, like Brene Brown, they're calling it shame or unworthiness. He called it inferiority complex, but it's the same thing. So what happens is most of us present like we've got our act together. Like this woman looks pretty much, you know, I'm okay, everything's fine, I've got it together. But what's really going on underneath the surface for many of us is that there's areas in our psyche, in our experience, in our thought processes, that are very much focused toward, I'm not okay. And when they don't feel okay, and they don't feel certain, and they don't feel secure, and they don't feel good about themselves, what happens is they enter into uninterrupted struggles. So really what Adler was saying is, if you don't understand how to create psychological safety and encouraging and supportive conditions, people will be very likely to have activated inferiority complex. And when they do, these struggles are gonna be showing up. Sometimes they're subtle and sometimes they're not. Sometimes they're internal struggles and sometimes they're external struggles or both. So those internal struggles are things like addiction and obesity and anxiety and depression and, and disengagement. That's turned inward. And then the struggles that are external are all over the place. All you have to do is spend two minutes on so social media and you'll see how much righteousness and win-lose is going on. You, all you have to do is look in almost every home, school, or business and see how much coercion and intimidation is used. 
And we, we're so used to it, we don't even see the subtler versions of it. We only see the really forceful versions of it, where it shows up in racism or ageism or sexism or all the isms. So all forms of misbehavior, all forms of discord come from this core of inferiority complex. So it really behooves us to learn how to deal with this. In Brene Brown's work, she's world famous. And people will come to her and ask her to come speak. And they still say to her, let's not talk about that shame stuff. It's a little dark and it makes people uncomfortable. And her response to that is, until we get this part, it's my number one platform. It was absolutely Adler's number one platform. It's our number one platform. How do we create conditions and conversations to diminish inferiority complex? Inferiority complex is triggered by fearful and limiting beliefs that we hold about one another. Blaming, criticizing, using control models, all of those things feed into the lack of psychological safety, the sense of activated inferiority complex. So the real question becomes, what causes inferiority complex, right? But half the time people are pretending this isn't going on. You, you know about it because we hear about how much addiction there is, how there's an opioid crisis, how we have more people on antidepressants than ever before, how we have more battles going on, whether it's internally to the United States or worldwide. So we have all the effects. We just haven't gotten down to this particular root and what causes this root. That's why this is more important for you guys to know than all the tools in the world because this is mindset right here. And this is uncovering what people don't like to admit or look at. It's more like you're actually experiencing more and more things that are discouraging to you than encouraging to you. And the people that are doing those discouraging things, oftentimes they don't even know what they're doing is discouraging. And you're gonna see that when I get into the description of the control models, because those are highly discouraging and interfering. So I'll try to keep tying back Okay, see how this would affect inferiority complex, right? Because we need to be able to connect those dots. We need to be able to say, wow, the way we're doing this over here is causing this thing over here. And some of them don't look like they should be causing that, but they do. We are social beings and we need healthy belonging and significance. Healthy belonging and significance is the opposite of inferiority complex. So you can kind of look at it as a contrast. When we are feeling that, we're feeling empowered. We feel like we have a voice. We feel like we have influence. We feel like we can make a difference. We feel lovable and lovable is very different than feeling loved. So lovable, if I'm trying to make you feel lovable, I'm listening to you without an agenda to change you. I'm listening to you without criticism, without negative judgment. I'm listening to you with real true curiosity and real true receptivity. And I'm listening to your words, I'm listening to your thinking, and I'm listening to your emotions without judgment. I would say this need is so great in people that, and, and so unfulfilled in people that we don't even know it's happening. Like in my family, I was very loved, but my parents did not know how to see me as a separate person. I was just an empty slate that they were supposed to write on. It's very important that you don't see them as a blank slate that it's your job to build the story upon. Because each person already comes with a lot of natural ability to uh, uh, learn and, and int interpret and decide. And the more that we respect and honor that, it's very different than fixing, converting, healing, and changing them. So a lot of people think feeling lovable is feeling loved. It's not, because my parents really made me feel loved they did not make me feel lovable. Do you guys understand the distinction? I would hold in your head this word, you're delighted by them. Because okay. when you're making them feel lovable, you're not even trying to give them advice or looking what's for what's best for them. Because my parents, I can tell you, they thought they knew what was best for me, but they never were curious about how I saw the world and what I wanted to bring to the table and what I might even be able to teach them. So when you are helping a person feel lovable, you're actually expressing your delight in them because you're taking the time to let them be a separate person from you that you're willing to open to. And that's very different than anything you're doing for them. It's so big in our world that this is not occurring. Out of all four of the needs here, there's two that are pretty, we're pretty blind to. 
and it doesn't take long to delight in somebody or be receptive to them. It really doesn't take a lot of time. But what's happened is we have such problems with our own inferiority complex that we don't make the space within ourselves to set a priority to be receptive to one another in a way that allows me to appreciate you and to actually be curious about you, which is a huge gift to another person. It cannot be faked. You can pretend you care, but if, if they don't feel that you're really receptive, they won't get that what they need from it. So it's very important that we understand that. Connected is important if you think about people, like right now, you can even see it in the protests. I don't know, I don't wanna get at anything controversial, but I think like I can see the African-American community feeling like the white people are connected with them in this new way. And it's really been interesting to watch that. But even if you take a situation like uh, school shootings or postal shootings, it's usually that the person who's gone crazy has felt completely isolated and disconnected. So it's going to happen to us in large and small ways, depending on how well this need is being fulfilled or neglected. This is the other one I was talking about that's hard for us to um, make sure is well fulfilled. And it's the, it's the need that people have to feel as though they can make contributions. So because we're so in inferiority complex, we don't even like asking people for things because it makes us feel very vulnerable. And yet we're robbing one another of opportunities to contribute. And so I remember one time when I took away using incentives and rewards and this person was really angry, it was in a school and he goes, well, how are we gonna get the parents to come to the parent meetings? We have to feed them a steak dinner and offer them a raffle and everything. And I said, no, don't do that. Call them, have the teachers call them and say, hey, would you bring a quote to share during the meeting? Or would you bring a story of success of your student? Or would you bring a bottle of soda? You know, because we have this really deep rooted need to be able to contribute. That's why people want to participate when there's a crisis, because there's room for them to be loving and caring and generous. And we rob each other of that. So this is a big problem in our workplaces, not understanding this. These four feelings feed the taming of the inferiority complex. So we're gonna be talking a little bit in the, in the next slides coming up later about how important it is for people to take turns leading a group review sessions on what they're learning in the culture model. And so sometimes you're a follower and sometimes you're a leader. So when you're the leader, everybody in that group is encouraged to support that leader in a way that they feel contributing, they feel connected, they feel lovable as if you're delighted in them taking over that process, right? So that's an example of creating leader follower agility, but at the same time meeting these four core needs. Let's say that one of your employees is doing some really negative behavior and you use a tool called redirecting negative behavior on the situation that's occurring or a, or a really good effective communication tool with them or something that resolves the negative behavior but does not rob them of their dignity and their sense of well-being. That's hard for people to imagine. Most people see a negative behavior and they think the only response is harshness, punishment, drawing something from them or bribing them. You know, they can't even imagine a solution to a negative behavior that doesn't involve any of those. And so there's tons of examples of where you would create conditions and conversations in which people would get new experiences of feeling empowered, lovable, connected, and contributing. When we did this originally in my family, we actively removed things from our parenting that would take these feelings away and built things in that would help people feel these four things. And that's what we do in corporations and in, in nonprofits and government you know, projects. We help to bring in the tools and the conversations and the opportunities that strengthen these four core needs. And then while it's occurring, the conversation is saying, see how that's meeting the four core needs? And it starts to cement, wow, we're getting rid of the things that diminish these and we're bringing in the things that build these. And you'll be, you'd be surprised how unconventional it can get and how amazing it can get once you start thinking this way. Another place we do this is when we teach mentoring, because in our mentoring, it's a, a a non-negotiable requirement that everyone in an organization is mentored every month. But it's very different when you, the manager, mentors somebody and then they get to mentor you back. 
because it's not a I'm higher and smarter and wiser and you're lower and less intelligent. It's we're both helping each other be emotionally intelligent and I get to contribute to you and you get to contribute to me. I get to appreciate you and you get to appreciate me. And it's a very strong new practice that most organizations don't do that is creating this back and forth. Okay, and, and that's just some of the bigger ones that I would, I would acknowledge. It is a difference between having limiting beliefs and fears about one another and keeping each other small versus seeing holistic and potential within people and then drawing that forth because you have that belief and you, and you know how to draw it forth. Completely different perspective. And you'll see that when we go through the control models versus the responsibility model. The beliefs in a control model are all negative and limiting. The beliefs in a responsibility model are very inspiring and holistic view of people. So one of the things that I want you to know that also gets in the way of the four core needs, the uh, personal responsibility and the engagement is that we don't know how to bridge certain things that are required for strong cross-functional teamwork. So every relationship starts out in pseudo community. So when I first meet people, generally, I'm looking for all the things we have in common. I'm looking for all the places where we're in agreement or where we're more alike than different. In any relationship, this is kind of the honeymoon stage. And it's not bad or good. It just is a fun kind of exploration time. What happens, though, is people can often get stuck in this way of operating with one another because it feels safe. They're afraid to make waves. They're afraid to get controversial. They're afraid to admit that they have differences. And so that what happens is what is a normal start to a relationship becomes inauthentic, boring, safe, non-creative. And so what happens is once you've been in proximity with somebody or a group over time, you're going to see where you have differences and where you have different ways of thinking or ideas, all of that. But what we traditionally do in relationships because of the way we've been conditioned is we go right away into this idea of I'm right, you're wrong. My job when I'm listening to you is to fix you, convert you, heal you, and change you. Can you see how this is the opposite of making people feel lovable, right? That how many of us appreciate somebody going, let me tell you how wrong you are and how right I am. I mean, we don't like that. <laughs> We're like, who died made you God, right? So this is the place where people leave relationships. And probably the worst of them is I've got to heal you, you poor, pathetic thing that doesn't know as much as I know. I mean, there's even ways people are patronizing in this uh, chaos. It can be sophisticated or it can be crude. It can look like this where they're in obvious chaos or it can look very subtle. This is where people leave relationships even if they physically stay in those relationships. They disengage. Maybe they stay in the job because they want the paycheck, but they're really not friendly not feeling good about each other, and not being able to be in empowered, lovable, connected, and contributing with each other. So this was actually work from a man named M. Scott Peck, who wrote The uh, Road Less Traveled, and A Different Drummer, and a number of other books. And this was his book on teamwork, A Different Drummer. And he said, we need to learn how to bypass chaos and go from being you know, that first honeymoon stage to a stage called empty. And empty sounds kind of bleak, but it is not intended to be bleak. Empty means you're empty of the agenda items that are in chaos. So the agenda items that you're letting go of and empty are the need to fix, convert, heal, or change people. A lot of people don't like this stage empty. It feels passive to them. It feels like, well, we're not rushing to solve anything then. And so we're wasting time but it's really not a waste of time. Like I tried to pick a picture where the person looked both curious and compassionate. Because when you're in empty, here's the four trust behaviors that you're practicing. You're being open, but not for the intention of converting anyone or fixing anyone or, or persuading anyone. So you're disclosing your thoughts and ideas and feelings, but not with an agenda. You're also receptive to the other person, what they're saying, what they're feeling. You're also respecting them. You see them as a separate human being with a right to have a different viewpoint. And you're even recognizing those differences as something to appreciate or to value or to look for the good in. And so even though it doesn't feel like a lot of solutions are happening, a lot is happening in this state of being with people. Definitely, can you see how this would create 
a sense of contributing to each other, a sense of lovableness with each other, a sense of connection that doesn't feel icky with each other. So it's a, it's a place along the way to authentic teamwork. I would say when you think of chaos, you want to think of power struggle because it's more like I'm invested in changing you. I'm invested in fixing you. Chaos can be a step forward from pseudo community because at least you're admitting we don't all think alike. But I would suggest that it's better to avoid chaos altogether and learn how to go from just the first level of knowing somebody to that deeper level of being curious and open, uh, recognizing their value. Again, it's that positive thought about people being good and bringing something safe to the table instead of looking at them with a paranoia toward them as though they have to think like you. So what happens from that is people move into authentic community from the state of empty only. Until you know people are receptive to you and respect you and recognize you as a valuable person, they will not be willing to solve problems with you. So when you do this well, you organically move into authentic community where now I can be honest with you. Now I can be straightforward with you and ask for what I want and it tell you what I expect, but it's gonna come from this place of, I, I already know you respect me, so it's not gonna be mean. And I'm gonna ask you to seek excellence with me and I'm gonna seek excellence with you. And I'm gonna make sure that I'm following through when I say I'm gonna do something and I'm gonna ask that of you. And so this is where really big work gets done. But you can't skip empty and you can't ignore chaos in order to get to that. So this probably is one of the most important things that I want to share with you today because I have a friend who is a former instructor and she was a former mayor. And when she saw what was going on with all the racism and the protesting and everything, she said, you need to go in and fix police departments. And I said, you know, I would not do it that way because the problems are deeper than any presenting symptom. If I were to work with police departments, I would work with a subset of the entire community that that police department is in. Just like I would suggest to you guys, when you work in culture change, you don't just do it to one group like the senior leaders. You have CEO to frontline staff in the mix. I also see that the core roots of the problem of racism or anything else are not usually recognized and addressed. And that's the soup I'm gonna be spitting in. So I love that I found this picture because it's so completely disgusting. Like imagine you have that bowl of soup and you're ready to eat it and somebody comes and spits in it. Do you really want to eat it? Chances are you'd be too disgusted to want to eat it, hopefully. <laughs> so Adler actually coined this phrase, spitting in your soup. And what he was saying by this is that sometimes something that we have uh, adopted as though it's wholesome and good needs to be spit in in order to get us to let go of it. Because the more we continue to believe it's healthy and, and a good way to be, the more we will continue to partake of it when it actually is the most important thing to dismantle and stop, you know, stop partaking in. And so what I'm going to be saying to you, the soup I'm spitting in, are all the ways we do control. And they do begin in childhood. They do begin in families, they begin in schools, they go on to be the way that we function as communities and in business. And so it's really important that we understand how long standing these control models have been and recognize all of the, the control models that we can possibly recognize. And I'm not saying that these are even all of them, but these are the four biggies that we see regularly. And I, I haven't discovered any other ones yet. First one is one that typically we can recognize a little bit more because, I mean, you can kind of see in our country right now, there are people that are saying dominate and let's be, you know, powerful and, and make sure that we show who's boss. And then there are other people saying no, because that becomes very brutal and it really doesn't seem to work very well. And so the belief that we're holding about people is if I think I have to police you or manage you or command you, my belief is that you of yourself can't be trusted. And my job is to make you do what I say or else. So we all know that people are used to operating in that, but generally that's why I believe we have a 71% disengagement rate. We either have people who are resentfully complying and doing C minus commitments, or we have people rebelling and resisting against that. So that one is a little more obvious to those of you that have been studying command and control. And, and it seems so reasonable if my title is leader or manager that I should manage people, but it's really not an effective approach with people. I would encourage you to stop managing people and lead them instead and develop them instead. 
This one is more of a surprise to people, using incentives and rewards to try to get them to be good citizens and have good behavior. The belief we're holding about people is it's my job to motivate you because otherwise you'd be selfish and lazy if I didn't dangle that carrot. And so originally when incentives and rewards were promoted, it was because research showed them to be consistently helpful, but that research was actually based on the work of Skinner, who was a scientist who did all of his studies on animals. And with animals, incentives and rewards are consistently effective. With human beings, those who have re really researched uh, incentives and bonuses and rewards and all those things that we dangle out front, it's actually been proven not only to be ineffective, but to be counterproductive. It actually diminishes the internal commitment to the behaviors and the values that people would normally operate from. It gets them off of that and diminishes that within them. And so it's kind of like if you were a little kid and your parent says, I'm gonna pay you a dollar for every book you read, your assumption might be it must really suck to read that parents have to pay me a dollar to read, right? And we can also feel kind of the manipulation in it. And what happens is people start becoming more selfish because of it. Uh, typically rewards are set up in a scarcity kind of a dynamic. So now we're all struggling and competing to get to the, the prize. And we might even run over and run past quality to get to the prize. And we will start saying, well, you gave me a thousand dollar bonus last time. What are you going to give me now? And we start creating this monster of people that become more competitive and self-focused and less in service. Anybody not know that that was a control model? And you start judging them like, well, what's, they're so you know, greedy and everything. And yet we don't see we've propagated it, right? Now, these two alone, I just want to speak on for a minute. The reason that I'm spitting so forcefully in this soup is because these look like they work. You will hear people say it all the time. I was spanked as a kid and it didn't hurt me. You know, they work in the short run. They work like if I held a gun to your head, I could probably get you to do what I want you to do if you thought I was really going to use it. And they work if I give you a big enough bribe and it doesn't feel too unethical, you're probably going to do what I want. But in the long run, what they don't, we don't see is all the negative repercussions of doing these things, which far outweigh what we think of as them working. So that's why I really want you guys to, to get so disgusted with these that you say, okay, 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 I'm willing to put them down. Because remember when that peace pledge was introduced? It was introduced through quadrant one, which made it very ineffective, except for that it provided this learning opportunity, which was great. But it could have been really, you know, another layer on the, you know, the thing of nobody trusts me and I can't win and all of that. I'll tell you guys a quick little story that I think is brilliant that Alfie Cohn tells. He says there's these little middle school kids who are uh, yelling all these nasty things to this old man in his apartment next to the middle school. Like he's out on his balcony and they're, they're heckling him. Hey, you stinky old man, you old goat, you know, I'm really being ignorant. And to their surprise, he comes out and says, hey, you guys are doing an awesome job. I'm going to give you all a dollar. So he hands them all each a dollar and like, great job. You know, and they're kind of shocked, like, what the heck is going on here? And he says to them, now, if you come back tomorrow and you can even bring some of your friends if you want, I don't have any more dollars, but I have a little roll of quarters and I'm happy to pay you all a quarter. And they go, okay, you know, it's not as good as a dollar, but we'll come back. So they come back and they start heckling and almost immediately comes out and says, oh my God, you guys are fantastic. Here, here's a quarter. He gives them all a quarter. And he says, now, I'm out of quarters, but if you come back tomorrow, I've got a little roll of pennies. I'll give you all a penny. And they said, a penny, forget it. And they never bothered him again. <laughs> and the reason that is so funny and insightful is he knew that if he could get them focused on his reason for motivating them, that they would drop their own motivation, which was the joy of heckling him. And that's exactly what happens when we use incentives and rewards. So uh, I really recommend you look at Alfie Cohn's work. I was telling earlier about how a CEO was yelling at me down the hall going, what do you mean you're taking away my reward system? You know, like he felt like, what am I going to do now? You know, I, I think we're so bought into this way of operating that we don't even believe that there's something better. Alfie Cohn also said this next quadrant is very hard for us to recognize and to halt our behavior in. And it's using judgment and bestowing it from above. 
And that judgment can be favorable and unfavorable. So it can be, oh, you made me so proud, you're the best math student. Uh, go make me proud. Go get me that big sale and make me proud. Or it can be, I'm so disappointed in you. So when we're doing that, the reason he said this is so hard to recognize and to avoid is because we are pulled into the inferiority complex so regularly that our only measure of relief is sometimes to do these a little bit more subtle bestowing things. Does that make sense? It's easier and less obvious form of rewarding to bestow or punishing to bestow our opinions of people. And what we're really teaching when we do that is your job is to please me. I matter the most. You're less deserving than me. And on one end of the spectrum, you have people who become brown nosers and people pleasers and afraid to be themselves and overly concerned about what people will think of them, which, you know, desperately affects creativity and innovation and even healthy pushback on authority, right? Healthy pushback on authority, but pushback. And we did this one exercise, and I won't go into detail, but I've never, ever seen anybody confront or reject the authority figure in the exercise, ever. So we're really taught this people-pleasing thing. At worst, people will look at the person who's bestowing and think, who died and made you die? And we'll really have kind of an F you attitude about them in our head that shows up in subtle or not so subtle ways that we resist and rebel. This is another one that surprises people, pampering and spoiling them. And by pampering and spoiling, I'm not so much talking about giving them ping pong tables or anything like that. I don't mean that kind of thing. I'm talking about when we do for people what they're capable of doing for themselves, when we say things they already know, when we police them in a, like a helicopter way with them, we have little faith in them. Like a really extreme example is the parents that paid to have their kids' test scores altered so that they could get into the uh, Ivy League schools. That's not very much faith in your kid that you think you have to bribe the system and overcompensate for them. And, and that you would think that you would create a very responsible, ethical child from that is crazy. And the same thing happens when we enable people, when we overcompensate and we create assumed inadequacy within them. I had a company that I was working with, they had about 25 employees, and we were talking about these control models. And I asked the employees, which of these control models is your manager most guilty of? And they all said pampering and spoiling that he was constantly reminding and nagging and, and looking over their shoulder and treating them as if they didn't expect good things from them. And one of them even went over to the whiteboard and wrote the word slam because I kept saying, say less, ask more, say less, ask more. So if most adults would have seen that eighth grade boy and said, oh, you're right, you're being bullied by a teacher, you poor thing, that's a misuse of power, we need to go and punish her. And that is not as helpful as what we did, which was help him to grow in being empowered and being lovable and being connected and being contributing. That was much more helpful than what we might have done if we would have thought, oh, you poor thing, we have to step in and, and rescue you. Do you guys see this? I mean, this, according to Adler, this was more harmful than using punishment, even physical punishment with people because it weakens their sense of who they are. It disempowers them. And that's because all of these control models are extrinsic motivation. They're like puppet strings. The sooner you can avoid these on any age of a person, the better. And, and that's been my personal experience as a mom of five kids, but also in working with parents and teachers on this work. It's, it's kind of a dangerous mindset to say it's okay to do a lot of this when they're really little. Even the way we do firmness and set boundaries doesn't have to be the autocratic way. It has to be firm, but it can be respectful and firm, which is very different than what it typically feels like in an autocratic. Recently, I heard, and I'm not trying to make this a political debate, but it was interesting to me, where President Trump suggested people throw, throw away the gentleness when they're treating criminals when they're being arrested, you know, like shove them in that car and show them that you're upset with them, you know. In our model, we teach that if you're pulling on the arms of the person taken to the cop car and you're shoving them in and you're clearly trying to punish them in your attitude, they're not, what are they going to be thinking in comparison if you firmly take them to the car and you firmly and respectfully make sure they get in that car safely? In one instance, they're going to be thinking, those pigs, they don't care about me. Nobody cares about me. 
In another instant, they're more likely to think, oh my God, how, why did I drink and get in the car and drive? Or are they gonna be thinking more about how they got themselves into this mess? So even from a perspective of having to be firm, there's an intention with which we do it that is control oriented and there's an intention which is responsibility based. So I just want you to hear through that because it can be a slippery slope otherwise. So Einstein said this and it applies to lots of things, but he said we can't solve our problems with the same thinking we used when we created those problems. And the thinking that I'm referring to by using this quote right here is the thinking that it's okay to use the control models. That's the thinking that most people do not want to challenge. Uh, it's kind of like a sacred cow. It's easy to say, I don't believe in this level of control, like police brutality, for example, but I don't want to look at it in my home with my kids or in the way that we do things in our workplace because the control models are kind of our sacred cows. So I just really want you to consider that we can't solve our problems when we hold on to those control models. So what do we do when we're creating a culture of responsibility? The first thing is that it's a shared power approach. And instead of having all those limiting and fearful beliefs, we're holding a positive belief about people. Either they are great and we're remembering they're great, or even if they're not acting great, we know they wanna be great. And if they're not showing up great, the assumption is always in this model that there are conditions and conversations that are a barrier to them having their four core needs met. So we wanna keep cleaning that up and we wanna keep providing a healthy leadership approach to them. So instead of managing and bribing and pampering and judging them, we want to provide mentoring support to them. And it doesn't mean that you, the leader, have to do all the mentoring. It just means I wanna make sure everybody in my entire organization is receiving opportunities to have that transfer of responsibility to them so that they pick up those tasks that are theirs to own. So those tasks are managing relationships, managing productivity, managing engagement, managing mood, managing your plan for progress. All kinds of things fall under that. But if you provide a mechanism for them to continuously be trained and then supported in emotional intelligence, which is self-awareness and then taking action into self-management, social awareness and taking action into managing those relationship dynamics. Now you've really cultivated people who, instead of being greedy and self-centered and entitled and rebellious, become fully engaged and self-directed. Because until we give up the control models, we will not pick up the model that creates intrinsic motivation. And we have a whole big program on what are the intrinsic motivators and how do we develop those? But we can't even get people to really pay attention to that if they're super attached to the control models. Setting aside a time specific to uh, working on these skills brings that clarity, uh, needed clarity, to the team. Um, first off, I get a chance to be seen and be heard by someone directly. Um, in my mentoring sessions, I feel important and I feel listened to. Um, I also love the fact that I'm able to practice the tools that we learn in our sessions one-on-one um, -on -one so that I can then take it back to the actual scenario that's happening and practice it live, in real life. Um, I think from the mentoring sessions, I get the fact that Kristen is interested and she's my boss. So it's directly related to just me being able to trust her. And so um, my mentoring sessions, I definitely get that support. Like if I feel like I'm not being engaged or I'm not f feeling engaged, that I have the tools and the help and the leadership to um, help me get back on track. Well, when I'm being mentored, um, I feel like that it's a validation of the things I'm seeing and I have the ability to talk about the people I'm mentoring while I'm being mentored. I get an opportunity to kind of talk about my fears and how I can develop as a person. Nice. It's really nice to get the mentoring because it's one-on-one. -on -one. I can read a lot. You can read any book or get any information, but actually applying it to my specific instant situation is different. Having the one-on-one -on -one time very, very much helps with that. I share this quote with you because it's one of my favorite new quotes that is such a truism. We have a problem with change blindness, which does not mean that we're not exposed to new facts. Like there's tons and tons of articles right now and, and books and everything and examples of people shifting to these more evolved states within culture. But there are a lot of people that even though they have those new facts, they don't really want to go out of their way to, to really take the time 
and to learn something new. Either they are just convinced that it's too scary or they're convinced that it's not valuable or relevant enough. I don't know the reason, but it is a certain amount of work we have to do in order to learn something new. Like I just became a vegan and I'm doing all these classes online and everything to learn how to do veganism healthy, you know, and to, to get good at it. So I'm going out of my way. And the same is true for anything that we do that's an evolution. The bigger problem that I see is in this second statement. We're afraid to question that what we've been thinking and, and doing could be out of date, especially those control models. We're so identified with those control models. Many, many people are identified with those control models. And they almost feel like it's a loss of their identity to just look at it as it's time to update them. Just like we wouldn't be ashamed if we updated our phones. So I, I see that for me, I only want to work with leaders that have a strong, positive ego. Because a strong, positive ego is a person that's not threatened by change, that is not threatened by creating more powerful employees and helping more people become leaders. A person who's very insecure and very mired in the inferiority complex would find it difficult to shift their mind around some of these things. So in a responsibility-based framework, these are some of the, the building blocks of that framework. So I already mentioned emotional intelligence and, and, and how important it is to have practical applications of it. I've already mentioned intrinsic motivation. I wish I had time to go into more depth about personal responsibility, but that is, um, there's certainly very important concepts and tools that we teach to even recognize when a person is in a state of personal responsibility or in a state of irresponsibility. And what are the symptoms of that? What are the beliefs that are occurring in that? But it's a super high priority. It's also important that in this model, everybody receives the same skills. And there are some leaders that are not used to thinking of it that way. They kind of act like, well, how could we ever afford the time and money for that? That's like saying we can't all afford to have a cell phone or a desktop computer. It's ridiculous. It would hold us back to have that mindset. And yet there's that kind of mindset about this sort of culture system, like as if it's only for a select few. And it really makes the people on the front line feel like, oh, I'm not one of the keepers of the knowledge. So in our model, because we use technology and digital platforms and everything, everybody can get the skills and they can get them consistently. And it's important that they do and that everybody participates in both leader follower dynamics within that. I want to talk a little bit about some values that build the trustworthiness, but really trustworthiness being the foundation means that when I look around in my workplace, if I don't have a 10 with everybody, not meaning we're best friends, but that we have nothing unresolved. So if I look and I think, oh my gosh, I'm not at a 10, I'm at a seven or an eight, I would go and I would work through that issue because that's how important trustworthiness and relationships are to my success and the success of the business. So it's, it's different than saying profit matters more than anything. It's people and trust between people that matters more than anything. And social interest, just to tell you what that is, I think it's sorely missing in our world and in our workplaces. And social interest is where we are highly sensitized to the consequences we cause other people. But what we do in our society is we focus on the consequences that could happen to us and the heck with the consequences we're causing other people. So the way that I see that happen is I remember one time being at a grocery store and a little five-year-old said to his mom, why can't we park in this parking spot right by the front of the store? And she said, do you see that $500 on the sign? A cop will give us a ticket and left to pay $500, right? So she's focusing on the consequences that could happen to him or to her. What she could have said was, hey, honey, this is such a cool community. We are so committed to making everybody have a good experience going to the store that we save these spots for people that can't walk. And so what I saw one time, and I have a video of it, is a social experiment where they took handicap signs and they put pictures of handicap people and a little message that said, thank you so much for saving this space for someone like me. And then they videotaped and they saw that every person that would pull into that spot that was not handicapped would see that sign and they'd pull back out and park elsewhere. And as soon as they took that sign down, people would go and park there again because they had disconnected from the consequence they're causing a handicapped person. 
and they only saw what it might do to them and they were willing to take that risk, which is a very dangerous game that we play when we ignore social interest. So I hope that gives you just a little bit of an idea of what I'm talking about. So everything inherent in a purpose is what am I committed to causing? I'm committed to causing that you love your life. I'm committed to causing consequences that help you become empowered, lovable, connected, and contributing. It's hard to measure the efficiency that we've gained from having a common set of tools, but I know that it's saving us time in meetings, troubleshooting issues quicker. I really think it's super important that everyone's included in there and the process and the um, teachings, um, mentoring sessions. We really can prompt each other for gaps. If we start to go along a tool and somebody says, oh, well, will you do it this way? Or you forgot that piece, or that was perfect and we can support each other. And there's no secrets at all. It's all out there. There's nobody that's the keeper of the knowledge or you don't have to get to the next level. Everybody's included. It's more equal that way. If everybody knows what we're working on doing, then they understand that we're trying to improve them, number one. And not only that, they're, uh, they understand when I say something, there's a framework and a language that I can use that we, we have a common understanding of. So now I want to get into the implementation of this. It's very important that people that are going to switch to this kind of culture know how to do it and know how to do it systemically and know how to do it thoroughly and to do it in a scaled manner. Just like you guys who, who are doing scaled agile know that you need a system and an implementation framework to do that. In ours, step one is making sure the CEO and senior team are supporting the transformation process. That means that they understand where sh we're transforming from the control models into this and that they're saying yes to that and all that it entails. And it means that you're measuring certain things to determine your starting point and then measure along the way to progression. So in our world, that means that you guys took the exploration survey. It gave you a read on what practices am I doing? And I will provide you with a report and what your next steps should be in terms of your priorities, whether it's with us or not, just in your own work. We also use a temperament assessment, which we then weave into our program. It's kind of like a DISC or a Myers-Briggs, only it's color. So whatever you use in your implementation framework, it's a helpful social intelligence tool to understand the differences between our temperaments as people and how to understand what's most valuable to different types of people and how to communicate effectively with them and so on. And then this one is my absolute one that I value the most, which is measuring how well do my people understand and approve of purpose, values, and visions, and then goals, procedures, and roles? And it's in that order. Do they understand and approve of these things? You know, are there areas that I need to clean up around these? And do I have all of those in place? And then also, there's multiple ways that we measure trust and multiple ways that we measure engagement. And then we come back and remeasure trust and engagement every six months because there are certain gaps that will show up and we'll be working to close those gaps and we'll be working on the ones that are highest problem first. And as those get cleaned up, others move up to the top until we just continually get that measurable continuous improvement. And even though the survey results are not directly return on investment, their improvement has a history of leading to financial improvements, not only with our work, but also the people that set this uh, survey forward. We also have clients choose a return on investment target. One of your top five priorities is turnover. So like if that was one of the areas where we were gonna help with a return on investment target, I would wanna know how much turnover do you have? Let's say it's 38% and it's costing you $4 million a year. I would want you to know what it's costing you now and what is the target that we wanna move you toward. Maybe it's going from 38% to 25% and that that will save you X amount of dollars. And that way you can see how we use a project to actually accomplish that goal. And then, then you can even say, hey, we invested this much in our culture transformation and we got this back on the back end because we set a return on investment target and got an outcome while we were in the process of learning this stuff. My name's Lisa Meyer and um, I managed about a thousand people in 300 locations. And for those of you that are in healthcare, everything's always about productivity. How many patients can you see? How many patients can you treat? How fast can you do it? How quickly can you get them well? And we slipped into really the control based. All we talked about was productivity. How can we get your productivity up? If your productivity's not up, we're gonna write you up. We're gonna terminate you. And it wasn't really the culture that we wanted to have with our team. So 
As I grew the regional team and got their skill sets up, we decided to do a pilot project with 15 of our facilities. And we really focused on how can you as a team meet your productivity goals because the ultimate goal was to see more patients. It, it was wasn't about profit that was going to sell it to the therapists that were working with the, the patients. It so we started working with, with Judy on some of the different modules and training the teams on how to take that responsibility themselves. And they came up with some really great ideas on how to improve productivity with without us putting the hammer down saying, well, you're not productive enough, so we're going to write you up. And it really became a, a great thing for our, our organization because we were able to get that group of therapists much more engaged, which helped our patient care, which helped our customer satisfaction. And really, we started to see those results um, when we ended our project. The next step is to make sure that all the senior team members are on the bus. So even though we have a structure, it's important that all the senior teams agree with the pace and the timing and the participation and all those things that are more particular to the organization. Our game plan that we bring to the table has multi pieces to it. It has setting that return on investment target, doing the kickoff, sketching the plan, doing the different assessments, doing a, a variety of things around training and mentoring, a variety of things around integrating values and sustaining change. But within that plan, we can flex it to fit what the unique needs are of your organization. These are the things that are comprehensive to an implementation process, assessments, mentoring, culture integration consulting, onboarding. How do you prepare internal subject matter experts on the culture so that eventually your organization is completely self-sufficient in maintaining the system? And how do you get them to go through these various training processes throughout? The next one is, and there's lots of subcategories to four and three, but I just at the surface, it's making sure that the managers and supervisors, so now all of the people in the mid-levels are recognizing, oh my gosh, we're focused on this foundation of trustworthiness. We're focused on helping people have this task ownership and become self-directed. And they're gonna be shifting out of those control models. So they have to have a certain level of buy-in because they're the ones that have been most frequently using the control models. So they have to be won over and really understand what they're shifting out of and into. And that then follows that you create a culture that is based on your values and on your purpose and the values that build trust. And there's a really good book on this. If you guys have not read it, it's an older book, but it's still a really good book. And it's called Delivering Happiness by Tony Shea. It's H-S-I-E-H, but he is the former CEO of Zappos and it shows how they, on a very practical level, integrated their values into their culture and into their operations. So the values that build trust are these. And I wanted you to just see, in addition to an organization's core values, it's always a stand for these values in addition to the core values. How do we create an environment where this is consistently happening and we're consistently assessing whether that's happening? If I had a relationship issue with somebody, or if I was mentoring you in a relationship issue, and let's say I said, yeah, I have a relationship that's a seven, I would say, which of these are you falling down on? We put box X's in those boxes. And which one, which one of these things is the other person falling down on? And now let's just pick one of those and apply a tool and take it forward to moving you in the direction of resolution. That's kind of how it works to work on these values that build trust. They become very practical experiences in the environment get very specific information on how to show up as trustworthy because if we don't have the same definition then we can't get anything done so it really really helps to all be speaking the same thing and we go over those eight values that build trust I talked to somebody today said oh that was so nice he was so straightforward in disclosing and it gives it gives everybody hopefully a, a sense of what what trustworthiness really means I don't just accept that oh, that's just the way this person is, or that's just the relationship, or we just don't get along well. Because I know the eight values that build trust, I know what symptom is, is being shown, and I know what the treatment is to address it. They might be acting that way because I'm not showing up in some way, or they might not know that I want something for more trust. So having that spelled out gives, gives a lot more distinct actions that I can take to build it up again. So I do know immediately when it's not working and I, I see it everywhere now and I can know I can make it better. Then you want to give everyone opportunities to operate in a cross-functional team. 
And so what's important about that is that like one of the ways we do that is through the best practice flip training. It's a best practice that comes out of education that says that when you expose people to content in multiple ways and in different ways and, in, and repeatedly, it's more likely to become relevant to them and memorable to them. So in our situation of flip training, first people receive content that's on individual online training and then it's reviewed in mentoring sessions initially and also ongoing. And then it's reviewed and discussed and practiced and adopted in group review sessions that are led by employees. And then it's integrated into the systems of the business. So let's say you all learn some tools around gossip, why we gossip and what to do instead. And then you practice those in your mentoring session. And then you go over them in your group review and you decide whether you're going to adopt this particular set of practices. And then it's integrated into the way that it's brought around every month or used when people are newly hired and things like that. And that's what causes it to stick and become the new norm. So in our work, one of the biggest ways that we help that cross-functional teamwork improve is by having everybody take turns in the group review sessions where they get to practice being a leader and a follower, and also in the monthly mentoring, especially when it's reverse mentoring or peer mentoring. It, it creates that healthy cross-functional ways of functioning together. And then the last result that comes out of this, this is the vision for this work, is how do you get these cross-functional teams to quickly and effectively and efficiently redesign systems, processes, and structures? This might as well say agile. Because when you have effective cross-functional teams that can do that fast, iterative, simultaneous kind of building, that's the ideal scenario. Right now, we have a customer who's an IT healthcare organization, and they are literally having to create solutions on the fly because of COVID. And they keep writing me, telling me how well they're doing because they have such strong trust and teamwork and high levels of communication and faith in each other. And that's really what you want your end game to be. To integrate the new behaviors into the organization, the most important one, after somebody's been through all the training and while the company is doing all of the integration of the concepts and making sure that they're continuing and everything, monthly mentoring is the glue that continues to hold it all together. So what, what happens in our companies is that people create their own subject matter experts. They can manage the process ongoing. They have teams of people that will help onboard new employees, but the mentoring is where the rubber hits the road every single month, every single person, no exceptions. We super emphasize the importance of not mucking with the process for the mentoring, not involving other conversations within the mentoring, and not skipping the mentoring, because it's a, a very important way to continue to integrate what's been learned and apply it actively. We also believe it's important to assess and course correct, assess and course correct, whether it's around the return on investment target and our trust alignment and engagement. You need to know, it's kind of like when you go to a physical trainer, you got to get on the scale so that you make sure that you're continually improving. And it's integrating things into the practices. So like when we teach just as an example, when we teach tools on how to stop gossip, that's just a very tangible example when new employees are hired every quarter, an organization might say, hey, go and welcome them and go and make your mind trust with them, which is going to them and saying, hey, I promise you, I won't say anything bad about you behind your back. You can count on that from me. And I promise I'll come to you if I have any problems with you and work them out with you. And I promise that if anybody comes and starts to say bad things about you, I won't listen to them. And I'll politely, you know, ask them if they want to do healthy venting, but I won't let them just rip on you because I'm making that commitment to you. And I also promise I'll try to get them to go back to you and work it out so that they don't hold on to that grudge or take it somewhere else. So that's a very, can you imagine being a new employee and having people come to you and do that with you, which also strengthens the employees who are doing that activity. And it's reinforcement from the organization that we are not only saying that these tools are important, we're gonna ask you to apply them at different points of time in your time here. And we're gonna even commit committees to bringing around certain aspects of those tools on a regular basis, along with the other 30 something tools, so that this is all our new norm. So here are the commitments that you guys wanna think about if you're gonna to go to a 
systemic change around a responsibility-based culture and to implementing a very comprehensive framework, whether it's your own or someone else's like ours. The two main questions are around the change blindness, that quote that I shared with you. Are you willing to go out of your way? That's the biggest one. You have to go out of your way in terms of time and money and commitment to building capacity for what you're doing. So it's, it is a going out of your way. And in our model, it's an 18 month process that takes about four hours a month. So it's, no, it's not a mammoth commitment, but it's a commitment. Four hours a month is four hours a month. Are you willing to consider and choose to consider that your past beliefs around the control models could be outdated? Because if you cannot do that, you will be less effective in picking up a responsibility-based culture. Is you have to be humble enough to go, you know what, I'm willing to think that those might not be the best and to try on really put aside and really dismantle those so that I can bring the new in without contamination. This time is yours. I wanted to make sure that you had opportunities to talk about your own concerns, questions you have, comments you have, Um, I have a question. I was wondering when we talk about the uh, flipped training, um, the first step is said individual, right? Um, yes. I'm curious to, to know why individual and not group, for example. Let's say, Enrique, that this month is on why we gossip and what to do instead. And I just told you that mind trust tool. And then there's also a tool called healthy venting. When you're learning about that for the first time and in your workbook, it's saying, Enrique, could you really go to everyone in your workplace? and promise them that you won't say bad things about them behind your back? You might wanna say yes if you were in front of other people, but in the privacy of your own office, you might say, heck no, that's how I connect with people. That's how I love ripping on Ron Howard, right? And so it, you get to be honest with yourself. And, and it might even be that you go, man, I could easily do that first one, but that second one about going to people when I have a problem with them, I could never do that with my boss. What if I get fired, right? So it, it's important that you learn it without the influence of others first, because it allows you to be personally reflective about it. Even at the end of each online individual module, we do a survey that asks questions around, do you understand what you're learning? Do you see relevance in what you're learning? How would you apply what you're learning? Would you wanna apply what you're learning? Because those are reflective questions that then involve a LifeWork Systems person. So sometimes when people say, well, I don't understand this, or, well, I think I could do this, but I don't understand that, or I don't see the relevance of this or that, they're already engaging in that process. And then when they go to the group review, it's not only helpful that they're going over the same content another time where it maybe clicks in a little more, and they're hearing other people's perspective on it, they're deciding whether they're willing to do it, and they're deciding if they're gonna even practice it and apply it right then, for example. And even the person who's leading the group session, they're being prepared prior to that group session so that they know both through a video and then through our guidance and then our oversight to make sure that there's a, a cohesion in the messaging and a cohesion in the application. So that example of the mind trust, for example, about 50% of the time, a group of people cannot commit to doing all four of those steps right away. And maybe what it'll come down to is, would you be willing to revisit this six months down the road when you've learned more skills and tools so that you would feel confident making this full of commitment? Or how about just committing to the parts you can right now and we'll revisit it later when you feel more security as a group, more um, skillful? Do you see how you kind of need both? Because otherwise it's too much too fast. That makes sense? Yes, yes. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Anybody else? <laughs> I have a question, Judy. Um, when we try to get you engaged before, it was that whole organizational level. Can we focus on, like, just say my line of business and be effective, or does it have to include the CEO? It does not have to include the CEO as long as you have the CEO understanding what you're transforming from into and that we have certain questions that he knows he's making commitments not to interfere or subdivert you. Because that's very important that they're not going to come in and, and undo what you're trying to accomplish or that they're going to defund it because they don't understand the value or relevance to you. We do have companies that do that, Ron, where a certain set of departments are involved, but the CEO doesn't necessarily hasn't bought in. But they fund it and they even recommend it to departments when something's going on, but they don't even know what they're doing over there. They just know they're getting results and they're not 
have any way in the way. About right. I have 100. If you include all my partners, like 150 people underneath me. Over in O'Fallon? Um, yeah, and it's about 80 to 90, um, I'll just say employees. But we're running into, I've, I've had very recently, I'll just say the culture is not percolating down to everybody. We're running into issues and mm -hmm. we need to do something. Otherwise, I'll use the analogy, if you grow too fast, you'll self-destruct because you don't have, I keep saying the infrastructure in place. And I'm not convinced that we even here locally have the infrastructure in place to be self-sustaining to grow talent up. We, we've got some very good managers, but we're struggling in this empowering of growing the talent. Some people it's hitting and some are not. Well, and mostly what happens in organizations where you have really good managers is they become overburdened. It becomes the 2080 dynamic where 20% of the people are carrying the load for the whole. And you really want them to know how to create leadership in their direct reports because it makes their job actually easier. But I would say in your organization, because of the size of it, I would do a scaled in version of the culture implementation. I wouldn't try to necessarily, you can, but I wouldn't try to necessarily fund and have everyone participate at the outset. I would create your internal subject matter experts, but what you really want to avoid is taking a top layer of your organization and only involving them. No matter what group you start with, you want it to scale between CEO or whatever highest level, maybe it's your, your title, all the way down to frontline staff. I'm coming into a new organization that's been around 75 years with some embedded practices, mm -hmm. senior leadership team who's not really trusted, a very top-down culture, and I'm a change, change agent brought in by the board to take the organization to another level. And my belief is it starts with the culture, you know, it's an inside out transformation. We, we can, we're in the process of setting our strategy, our vision, our direction, but we're not going to get there or get there as quickly if we don't have this kind of culture. And it's, it's, I guess my questions are around where to start. I've been doing this more intuitively and patching things together as opposed to having a, a, a complete system. Um, the last time I did something like this, we sort of created our own. But I'm, I'm getting resistance in particular from a very high performing COO who doesn't want to let go of the reins and empower people and delegate and mentor. Um, and my question is just really where to start? Where's the best place to start? So a couple of things come to mind as you're talking about this. When you're saying I have these older leaders who you know, are kind of old school, that's why it's very important that they are mingling with through the process, those that are willing at all, mingling through this process with people at all levels. Because if you sort of liken them to the police departments that are being defunded right now, it's not helpful to just focus on one group as being part of the soup. We're all in a group dynamic together. This group dynamic is much bigger than any presenting symptom. And people sometimes don't even know there's a new way to do it. Like, you know that there's a responsibility way to do it, but I bet a lot of those leaders have never even been deeply exposed to that or have been even shown that it's been proven to work. So they're still kind of on that idea that, that everything they're doing just needs to be done a little harder for it to be useful. <laughs> so, I mean, it's kind of like Alfie Cohn says, you start getting bad behavior from the control models and it just reinforces in their mind, you just need more control. I mean, you just see that sometimes. So I would say where there is any receptivity in a high level executive, bring that executive to the table first. I would also say, COOs are super important to this process. It's generally the place we come in is with the chief operating officers because they're usually a little more accessible than the CEO and they're not as conventional as the HR executives who tend to be very threatened by change in general. I know that's a sweeping generalization, but COOs more than even CFOs, they care about performance and productivity as the highest priorities. So when you get them bought in, they are the strongest champions and they're generally where we come in the door. So I would say if maybe the time spent with educating the COO and letting that COO lead the change process with you would be the best way for you to get it adopted into the organization. Because right now it feels like that person is holding a barrier between you and the change that you believe needs to happen. Is that true, Ron? Is that where? Yeah, yeah it, it is. 
and they hold a lot of power. So I don't know, do you have a belief that they'd be able to be won over if you could give them compelling information on this? I'm believing it may, it may be a, a, are you on the bus conversation? Yes. I, I, I'm, I'm not sure she is able or willing to. If she's not, what you can do, I would say would be the next best place to start would be to, to create a team of people from all levels of the organization that you believe would be good first adopters of this because there's nothing more powerful than a success story to promote the next group. I'll just tell you a funny story and a sort of sad story. <laughs> I was working in an organization where the CIO brought us in to do a project. And one of the tools that we teach is called the frustration tool. And in the frustration tool, the process goes like this, and I'm going to use it like as if it's a family example. Ron, I don't like it when you leave the toilet paper roll empty. So I'm saying I don't like it when you do this behavior. Because what I want is I want us to be a family that has each other's back. And I want to know that I'm peaceful when I go in the bathroom, that I'm going to have everything I need. So what I want from you, this is the third thing, which is a change of behavior request. What I want from you is to commit to changing over that role if you're the last person to use the last piece of tissue. Are you willing? So this very timid secretary in this project area had a CFO who had not been trained in this culture approach. And he was kind of the kind of leader that almost prided himself on leading by intimidation. Very old school. And he worked with this secretary about half time. And he would make meetings with her and then he'd cancel them, but he wouldn't tell her. So she'd get to the meeting and she'd be freaked out. Did I go to the wrong place? Did I have the wrong date? Did I have the wrong time? And this happened repeatedly and it was very disrespectful and it much frustrated her. And it wasn't until she saw this tool that she realized, wow, this tool would help me address this without ripping anybody apart or hurting anybody's feelings. Because that's really what her highest priority values were. Harmony, respect, inspiration, good teamwork really mattered to her. So she went and she practiced with her coach on how to use the tool with this person who was her superior, right? And she went to him and she said, I'm gonna pretend it's you, Ron. Mr. Ekstrand, I don't like it when you make meetings with me and you cancel them without letting me know that you've canceled them because I want us to have a lot of mutual respect and I wanna be the best administrative assistant you could have because I know what I'm doing and where I'm supposed to be and I want your support for that. So what I want from you is to ask that you call me, email me, or text me if you cancel or change a meeting. Are you willing to do this? That, so she followed the pattern. This is what he said. How dare you? Who the hell do you think you are, lady? I pay your paycheck. You don't pay my paycheck. Can you imagine this timid person who's like no make waves kind of person? So she calls me up afterwards and she tells me, and I said, are you shaking about now? And she goes, yeah. And I said, all right, you know that we say, whose yard are you in? Like when you think about your yard, your yard was to go use this tool and to use it masterfully. How did you do in your yard? And she said, well, when I think about that, I'm actually really proud of myself. I said, yeah, your yard looks really good. His reaction, whose yard is that in? She said, it's in his yard. And I said, then remember, the rule is mind your own business, which means don't mind his yard. That's not your business. You did everything you could and you knew you did something that was respectful to both of you. So I, I just ask you to train your mind to stay in your yard and be proud of your interaction with him. And so about six months later, she called me and she said, I just have to tell you, he's never done it to me again. And not only that, he keeps coming over here and saying, well, what's this stuff you guys are doing over here? And she'll say, oh, it's just this life works thing we're doing. And she kind of downplays it, you know. And they'll say, well, we have a lot of gossip over in our area. And she'll say, well, we used to have that problem too. And we have a lot of people that are being really disrespectful. Yeah, we used to have that problem too. And then she hears him going into the CIO's office and saying the same thing. What's this stuff you guys are doing over here? Because what happened was people would leave his department to come work for this department and they could not believe how different it was. And so the word was getting out. And even though he still wanted to kind of hold on to that intimidation thing, he was being persuaded by the results that they were getting. So I would not lose heart, Ron. There's got to be people there in that size of a company that are willing to understand the evolution of what's happening. One of the things we have are a set of industry articles written by Forbes and Inc. And, all, and now we have about 15 of those articles. And we actually download them and mark them to show where the current trends and the kind of culture needed to meet those trends. 
and highlight where our culture model converges with all of that. Because you, you have to take your leaders and connect the dots for them about how this is going to keep them competitive, how this is going to fit into the trends that you're moving toward, which I think you had quite a few of them, digital transformation, globalization, whatever yours were. So it's a tricky walk that you have to do because you want to find a way to create success and then continue to have the conversation with them about that success. And I know you did say turnover was one of your big challenges. I would pick an area where perhaps there's turnover, but really good leadership in place, because that could be a return on investment target that you can measurably show financial gain, which it also speaks loud to executives. Is there anything else you have around that? Um, well, one of the things we're doing, the, the turnover is primarily in our frontline positions are called direct support professionals. And okay. The approach we're taking is using a standardized instrument that was designed for our industry to select people on the front end who are a fit for the culture we're trying to create. Because I can teach them how to work with a child with autism and how to do lifts and how to de-escalate and you know, use tools and that. But if their values are not aligned and if they are not a good fit for the role, if they don't at the fundamental level have honesty and humility, um, they're not a good fit for the role. And mm -hmm. so, the tool has been used before to drive my turnover from 50% down to 25% and shift the culture by bringing in the right people. I think it could have worked even better though, if there, if there was this cultural support for what we're trying to do. And, and, yeah. And I mean, it, it almost sounds like, are you using something like predictive index? Actually, um, we're not using predictive index. We were thinking about using predictive index as one of those connector uh, tools so that, we can you know, learn about each other and each other's differences and our styles and that. So we, we have a, 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 a person on our board who has the license to do it for their recruiting at an accounting firm, and he's uh, going to allow us to uh, piggyback on that. You know what? I really, really like that tool, but I also like the, for the uh, masses, I really like the intrinsics tool, but I think for you placing people, but one of the things we do with organizations is once this culture model is in place, we help them to design hiring questions, interviewing questions, and various behavioral aspects before a person is hired. Because you're right, you want them to have a connection to your core values, but you also want them to be a person that would be receptive to the kind of practices you're asking them to do in this kind of a model, which are not the old school practices. So knowing their receptivity and that they're coming in with their eyes wide open is super important. We've had people that have hired a less skilled person because like you said, they're a better fit for the culture. But if you guys don't even have the culture defined, you'll miss some of those features. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I'm glad that you value those things, those assessment tools, because they're very powerful. I'll send you some handouts on more detail. Like there's a lot of really beautiful detail on the four stages to authentic community. There's some handouts on, you know, the four core needs and how to recognize where they are being supported or diminished. I'll send you some information on the process itself of the implementation so you have that. I really, really appreciate you guys. And if you have questions for me offline, please ask them. 